All right, we want to let people in. Okay. All right, we got 78 people. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello. 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 Yeah. Look, at, look at all the little squares on the window. Woo. Hi, Christy. Oh, oh, Christy. Oh, hi. hi. This is really. Hi. Oh my okay. God. Hi, Christy. Hi, hi Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi, Christy. Hello. Oh. I've got oh, like. Start crying, y'all. Oh, let me stand. Can you grab our wee Yeah, I can see you. Where's the one? Oh, there she is. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to settle for my avatar. Hey, Raven. Uh, Stefan, are you there? Yeah, there's Hi. Stefan and Rob. Hello. <laughs> all my peeps from all over the world. Yay. Hi, I think we're in good shape to go ahead and get started. So this lady needs no introduction. Um, I don't have anything formal really prepared um, for this session. Just want to start off by thanking Christy so much um, for joining us. She has been such a huge supporter um, of GemCon over the years and many people have said um, if we could only have one guest and we had Christy it would still be an amazing GemCon just because she has so many stories and such great insight into um, the show and everything that was involved with it. So um, thank you so much Christy for joining us and hanging in there with us. I know we wanted to be in person in Minneapolis but if we can't be in person this is the next best thing. Um, so just wanted to kick off with that and would love to just, um, I know we have a lot of seasoned Gem Con attendees on the line. We also have quite a few new people. So everyone's knowledge and background is um, different. So just want to um, open it up, um, asking you how you first got involved um, with the show. Yeah, that, that seems like a good place to begin. Also, yeah. I, I want to very, to first call out, um, Liz and Rachel and Jessica and everybody that has been working so hard to make this happen in a virtual way. I think they've done an awesome job and uh, need to be very highly commended and recognized for pulling off quite a feat in a short period of time. So here we all are in this new reality, this COVID-19 reality, and, and we're making it work. So there you go. So I first started working in animation roundabout 1979 or so, <clears throat> started working for Stan Lee's new studio that he, he had just begun with the Patty Freeling. And so I started writing animation and Spider-Man and Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And then from there, I moved into writing for G.I. Joe, which was a Sunbow production. And of course, you should all be familiar with Sunbow productions. But for those who may not be terribly familiar with their background, they were actually um, it was actually Griffin, Griffith Bacall, and they were a New York advertising agency, and they ended up uh, taking on the challenge of creating animation series for Hasbro, because Hasbro was one of their clients. And so they ended up creating G.I. Joe, and it was tremendously successful. And so when um, Bill Sanders came to Hasbro with this idea for a toy, new kind of a toy line, Hasbro then came to Sunbow, and uh, to get have them develop a series. Well, actually they didn't develop the series. I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. In fact, when I was, I was then contacted by Sunbow because they knew me very well at that point because I've been writing for G.I. Joe and they really, really liked my work on G.I. Joe and I was a female writer. So I kind of had everything going for me. And uh, <laughs> so they, they approached me about writing this thing that they call, at the time they called it M, just the letter M. So it was M in the holograms. And the initial assignment was actually to write 15 short segments. So it was kind of like a mini series, but they were each only about between six and seven minutes long. And they were being sandwiched in the middle of a half hour program. And it was, it was a half hour that was either called Super Saturday or Super Sunday, depending on what market you were in. And the first segment like six or seven minute segment was like a, a very action boy oriented something and I, I didn't pay any attention to what those words but other people know inhumans and something else 
And then in the middle would come jam, and then, then there'd be one more third segment, which was, would be another boy-oriented one. And so the, the initial structure of what I created was designed for these 15 short segments. And the instructions I got from Hasbro were, were, were really conflicting because they said, well, we really want the romance and the fashion and the glitter and, and you know, all of that stuff. But at the same time, it has to have enough hard action or, or cliffhangers so that the boys won't turn the dial. So what they were terrified of was that, you know, boys would start watching the show and then they'd get to jam and they'd go, what's this? And, and turn it off and change the channel. So I got all of these conflicting instructions about how to, you know, trying to keep the girls watching the show. So that's why you'll notice with those 15 segments became the first five half hours. So they, they repackaged it, they re-put it together. And because there wasn't quite enough story and animation for a half hour to put three of them together in a half hour, I ended up having to write like little tiny short bits that could be added to it. So there'd be like a few lines here, or a few lines there. I had to go back and see what we have and figure out how, how can we just like pad it just a little bit more, put a little bit more in so that it would come out to the full roughly 21 minutes for a half hour of animation at the time. But you'll notice that when you look at those first five half hours, why they seem to have this kind of odd structure where there's like this really hard cliffhanger ending at, at the end of each act break because it was designed for those 15 minute short segments. And then somewhere during that process, I believe, I can't remember exactly when, but during that process of writing the 15 minute short segments, we got the word that it was going to go to a full 65 half hour syndicated run of animation. And luckily, when I developed it, when I did the development work on the characters and the setting and the situation, I kind of went overboard and you know, I created tons and tons of material. And we needed that because we're going into 65 half hours, you want to make sure you have lots of characters and you know, lots of threads and subplots and various things going on that you can draw from. Um, one of the other interesting tidbits that I only recently rediscovered because I had forgotten is that because we had initially planned it for just the 15 minute segments, at the end of those 15 minute segments, Rhea was going to learn the truth about Jerrica and Jem, that secret was going to be revealed. But then when they decided to go to the 65 half hours, Jay Bacall came back to me and, and said, you know, let, no, don't, let, don't do that reveal. Let's keep that going, you know, keep that nice little triangle going. And so we ended up doing that. So basically, uh, I got into it because Sumbo knew me, because I'd written for G.I. Joe, and because they really liked my work, and they just went from there. Awesome. That is such um, great insight, Christy. And you have such a great memory. We've had guests where they're like, I don't remember. It's just, you know, it was a long time ago, and you're- No, no, you're no, I got to correct you on that. <laughs> I have Very a terrible memory. I, I have an awful memory, and the, and the only reason I remember some of this stuff, well, there are two, two different reasons, actually, and one is because I used to have it all in my files and, and several years ago before the, the live action movie came out, I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write a memoir about Jim, about my, my life up to and creating and, and about creating, doing Jim, developing Jim. And so I started working on that memoir and in the process of working on that memoir, I went, had to go back to a lot of my old records and a look at a lot of things and it, and it reminded me of stuff that I had completely forgotten. Um, tragically, my home and everything I had was destroyed in the campfire in November of 2018. So all of my files are gone. All of my gem memorabilia is gone. Everything, everything I had is gone. So I can't go back and look at that anymore. But because of the memoir, I, I have some stuff that I looked at and some stuff that I scanned or, or may have maintained. And then the other thing I do sometimes is I go back to early interviews that I did, like they're interviews I did maybe 20, 30 years ago when my memory was actually better. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I get sometimes I'll, I'll read things that I said 20 years ago. It's like, oh, I really, I'd forgotten about that. So, so no, I wish I could claim to have a good memory, but tragically I don't. Well, from over here, I would say you have a good memory. I, you talked about um, being involved with Marvel and um, some of the male properties. I would love for you just to kind of give us a sneak 
peek or uh, look behind the curtain, so to speak, and tell us a little bit more what it was like working in that field back in the 80s. I know you were one of the few females that um, were in that field, so I'd love to kind of hear a bit more about what that was like. It's, it's interesting because I never once ever stopped to think about the fact that I was a woman trying to break into this field. It, I mean, it's never even occurred to me to think about it. All I knew was that I, I loved Marvel Comics, and when the opportunity to write Fantastic Four came along, I, I just absolutely jumped at it because I loved the comics, because I was a comic book, grew up a complete comic book freak, obsessed with comics. So for me, the exciting thing was getting to write these superheroes that I had loved my entire life, like, like Fantastic Four and Spider-Man. And I never stopped to question or think about being blocked from doing something like that because I was female. It just never even occurred to me. I was just so focused on wanting to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish and getting into the field that I, I simply didn't think about it. And frankly, I, maybe I was just extraordinarily lucky, lucky but everybody that I dealt with, um, all, all the men that I dealt with, were welcoming, helpful, friendly. I only had one instance of sexual harassment, I think, through that entire time period. And, and so it was really, um, I think luck, maybe a lot of luck, but just there were a lot of good guys that I got to work with. Like Steve Gerber was just amazing. He was just the most wonderful person and such a mentor and such a friend and such, such a fantastic person. I had such great luck getting to work with him on G.I. Joe uh, as my story editor and he was just phenomenal, you know, and, and Roger Slifer was a good guy and there were just so many good guys and Jay Bacall was wonderful. All, all these good people, Joe Bacall, Tom Griffith, they, they were just fantastic people to work with, you know, they, there was never any question about whether I was qualified to do something. It was like, oh, you interested in writing G.I. Joe? Yeah, sure, write G.I. Joe. They just wanted good writers. That, that was it. So for the most part, I, I would say I've been blessed in my career to, be work, to work with really good people. That's awesome to hear. I know not everyone who's worked in the field um, can share that sentiment. So I'm glad, um, glad to hear that. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the day during our cartoon panel. I would love it if you could just chat a bit more about um, the writer's Bible and also um, you really brought the gem universe to life. Um, you didn't really have much to go on when you were given the assignment of writing for gem. So I would love it if you could just touch a little bit on the writer's Bible and just the short, the little bit of information that you were given to work with and having that turn into, I mean, you created the Starlight Girls, you, you created all of it. And I don't think a lot of people realize how, what little content you had to work with. So I would love it if you could just chat a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, what, this is very intriguing to me was many, 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 many years later, I'm talking a lot of years, decades later, um, I started working with a young producer who wanted to do a movie version of Jam. And this was like way before what John Chu did. And so we started working on, on finding out the situation with the rights, which were at the time just a real mess. And in the process of doing all of that, we discovered about the exist existence of Bill Sanders. Now, Bill Sanders was a toy designer. And we visited, he, he was deceased, unfortunately, at that point, but we visited the woman who still had his papers, his personal papers. And amongst those personal papers was a, sh a single sheet on which he had sketched out the idea of a rock and roll band with a cool car and this holographic computer. But they were all boys. So he had initially envisioned it as a boy toy line. And then somewhere, he, he then hooked up with a couple of other people that were also involved with Hasbro and designing toys. And they took it to Hasbro and Hasbro was looking, I think, for something to go up against Barbie. And so I, they took, I believe they took just that basic concept that he had, or either they, either Hasbro took it or the people who, you know, took it to, to Hasbro did it. I'm not sure who, but at any rate, somewhere along the way, this boy band with the holographic computer became a girl band with a holographic computer and a rock and roadster. And then the, and the misfits got added in. So I didn't know any of this at the time. So this is all deep background, but it was something I knew absolutely nothing about uh, when I was brought in. So it was just interesting to find out about that in retrospect. 
But when I was first hired, and, I, and you have to understand that this was pre-internet, so everything was happening over phone or over mail, courier, whatever. I mean, not, well, not totally pre-internet, but you know, email was not really a thing. <laughs> I mean, so it was like there were bulletin boards and we could, uh, Steve Gerber is the one that made me transmit computers by, uh, um, scripts by computer. So we, we had actually established a little bit of doing that. And we were all doing everything by pretty much by phone. So I was getting stuff from Jay Bacall in New York while I was out in Cal up in the mountains of California. So a lot of this was just a, a matter of talking and, and stuff that they would mail to me and so forth. And so initially what I got was a bit sketchy and they gave me the, the, the layout they gave me was, well, there's going to be the M and the holograms would be the, the, the good girl rock group. And then we're going to have this, you know, Ms. Fitz originally M S F I T S. And, but then it became just the misfits. They're the bad girls. And, um, there's going to be the boyfriend doll named Rio and one of the girl dolls, Kimber is going to be a sister. And that was, oh yeah. And of course there's synergy, the, the holographic computer and there was the car and that was kind of the layout. And what was also difficult is they kept changing the names on me almost like every other day. It felt like they were changing the names. So M started out as, M and then became Gem because they ran into problems where they couldn't trademark a letter of the alphabet, I believe is what it was. So it became Gem. And then she started out, I think, named Morgan and there Misty and she kept changing names and then, she, then Joanna and then she finally became Jerrica. And I think Kimber's name stayed the same, but um, Shane and Aja's names kept changing around. Pizazz's name was always the same, but Stormer was originally Rue, and um, I can't remember what Roxy's original name was, but the names kept changing around. And of course, which instruments they played, they kept changing that around because of course, they're still working on the doll line. They're still figuring out what the dolls are at this point. And so I kept begging and begging them to just sit, show me something, give me something visual to work with. I want to get a sense of what these characters are supposed to look like. Just give me something. And eventually I did get some Polaroids of the prototype dolls, which didn't at that point even include Shayna, which is interesting. So she came along just a little bit later in the process, but um, that gave me something visual to work with. But everything else did come from me. Um, the whole concept of, of who the characters were, their backgrounds, their biographies, how they interacted with one another, uh, the whole Starlight Music, Starlight House, all the Foster Girls, Eric Raymond, who of course, as many of you know, is named after my brother. So he, he got to be a villain, which he loves, by the way. <laughs> and um, I, had to, I had to include the Rock and Roadster early on because it was part of the doll line. So they wanted that, which is one of the reasons why, and again, you look at the, the way those first five half hours are structured and those think about those 15 minute segments and they wanted all of this stuff crammed in up front. So, which is why you kind of get this odd thing of suddenly there's all, the, there's this car and <laughs> these clothes, all of this stuff. And that's because it all had to be crammed into those early segments. And, um, all of that background, all of the other, all, the, all the secondary characters and the, and the whole setup of, of why Jem was doing what she was doing and the, the, the love triangle between Jem, Jerrica, Rhea, all that stuff, um, all was part of my development process. Were writers Bibles, because I know um, that was something that you developed really, and we talked about this earlier, how even the minor characters in the show had fully fleshed out storylines and you felt like you could relate and connect with every single character that was featured, even if they were just in one episode. And a lot of that I think can be attributed to the writer's Bible that you created. And so even if you didn't work on every single episode, if another writer came in, there was still that, um, that cohesiveness amongst um, the episodes and the storylines. Um, was that something that was really popular at that time where people really using writer's Bibles or was that something um, that was new? Oh no, that, that was an established practice. That was something I picked up from um, doing animation. Uh, when I first started working with Stan Lee at, at uh, DePatty Freeling, I, I actually ended up doing quite a bit of 
kind of bits of odd development here and there um, for them, things that didn't necessarily ever get on the air. I, I even actually wrote uh, an entire script for an X-Men series very early on that never got onto the air. And um, so I did quite a bit of development work and in the process of doing that kind of development work, I, I discovered um, what was out there and the process, what people like to do. But there's, there's actually a couple of different ways you can approach show Bibles because um, you can do something that, that is more of a pitch Bible, which just gives the, the basics of a show which are when you're trying to sell it. But a writer's Bible, you want that to be something that can be handed off to anybody else that's working on the show and, and then they know everything they need to know about it. And like G.I. Joe, for example, had a massive writer's Bible. It was in a three ring binder that was about three inches thick. And it, you know, had, wow. because, think of how many characters there are on G.I. Joe. I mean, there are just dozens. Then there's all the weapons, there's all the vehicles. And every time you were handed a show to do on G.I. Joe, they would say, use these characters, use these weapons, use these vehicles, and then you'd have to figure out a story that could incorporate those things. So they had just this absolutely massive doorstop of a Bible, but it was from all of those processes that I, I learned um, what writers needed to have so that they would understand a show, understand the characters, and, and you include things like do's and don'ts. I mean, in, in the Bible that I wrote, I actually did a bunch, of, even though, I probably didn't need to. I did a bunch of research into holographic technology at the time, and I tried to lay out groundwork for what you could and couldn't do with holograms. I mean, you shouldn't be able to project holograms through a solid wall. I mean, there were, there were various things that I wanted to establish so that even though it was fantastical, you still want to have some rules so that it makes sense. Because good fantasy, no matter how you know, unusual or strange you want to make it, you still want to have basic rules of fantasy that make sense and you don't want to break those rules because as soon as you break those rules, you, you break your world. So when you go to watch a Harry Potter movie, you don't want to see him whip out a 45 and shoot somebody. You know, you, you have basic rules of fantasy that you want to follow. And so the writer's Bible is really covers all of that kind of stuff, all that terrain, all that information that, that a writer wants to have in order to be able to write for the show. Very cool. Thank you for um, giving us that um, background. I know you hinted at it a little bit um, before. Were there any concepts or storylines that you wanted to do that you got pushed back on? I know one of my personal favorite episodes is the one um, with Haven House and the Runaways. Um, and it was a huge, um, really sentimental for me. And I know there was some more, I think, that you wanted to um, explore with that um, story arc. So any any pushback that you got at all or um, storylines that you wanted to explore that you weren't able to? Uh, the only one that I never really got to do, well, there, there were other ideas that didn't get done for one reason or another. There was one that Ellen Guan and I um, wanted to do about a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, <laughs> ironically, which they didn't want to do for some reason. It might have had to do with, um, there might have been legal reasons, who knows, you know, trademark reasons or something like that. But um, we didn't get to do that one. And there, there, were, there were various other ideas that I wrote up that for one reason or another didn't get done. The, the only one that I I've actually got pushback on was I wanted to do one about a kid dealing with an alcoholic father. And I thought it was acceptable what I did. You know, it wasn't super hard edged, but it showed that alcoholics are difficult to deal with. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's tough on a kid having an alcoholic parent. I'm, you know, I was, I was going to set it within the, uh, the we'd already, I think we'd already done Kate Jim about the radio station. So I was going to have him, the father involved with Jim through the radio station and, but have this whole situation with the boy and, Hasbro wasn't comfortable with my particular take on it. And they wanted me to really back off on it quite a bit in terms of, of like soften it up. And my feeling was if I couldn't do it right, if I couldn't do it to my satisfaction, it wasn't worth doing. And so I, I elected to just not do it um, rather than not, not do it the way I wanted to. I know I'm just looking at the the messages in the chat box here and that um, a lot of people commented on how you did such a really great job of kind of pushing the envelope and the stories were kind of ahead of its time. I mean, you still had kind of that classic um, rock and roll um, 
glamour glitter stuff with you know being a rock star but you had a lot of that like kind of it was really a soap opera too but there was just um you really related to all the characters and the kids and um even danny um the one character um the runaway in the episode with haven house um transitioning on that i would love to hear about if you had any idea when the show aired how it was doing and one of the things that i think was really unique to the show was the psas which kind of tied into the content with the storylines so i would love it if you could just kind of touch on that and how you were able to gauge back in the 80s before social media how the show was actually doing or if you had any idea how the show was doing even let me back up and say that the, the character of danny came out of that outline that I had written for the show about the alcoholic parent. So I took some bits of that and put it into that episode about the runaways. So he actually, and I ended up using the character, but not dealing specifically with alcoholism, but I kind of, kind of bridged over to it anyway and, and got it. I in. love Danny. And um, the PSAs were part of this whole thing that was happening in the eighties where, where there were these, there were these groups who were on this, you know, save the children kind of crusade groups uh you know the, the super do-gooders who thought that they somehow had to protect children from because children somehow could not tell the difference between the show and the commercials and so it became part of this act this i, I forget the name of the act now but there was, there was this act that was about protecting children from commercialism somehow and part of that became they required what they called bumpers so these PSAs were acted kind of as, as bumpers in a way. They, they were part of making this group happy because they were promoting a pro-social message. And there were also always these little bumpers and you've seen them like before the commercials, after the commercials, those little bits, you know, just little bits of animation that aren't part of the show. You know, those bumpers were things that were required and they were supposed to be like something that differentiated the show from the commercials for the kids so they couldn't somehow they couldn't be confused by this you know like I, don't, I think everybody underestimates kids they're a lot smarter than they think and and i always took that attitude when i was writing the show um but, but being really pre inter pre widespread internet the, the no web you know no social media and no, any of that it was hard to really get feedback on the show at the time um, there were, once in a while I'd get a letter, which was nice. And I didn't have any sense of what impact the show was having until we did run the runaway episodes, the two-parter episodes. And in it, they ran the name of a hotline for runaway kids. And so I started getting this feedback about the hotline was just flooded with phone calls after those episodes ran. And they were just getting calls from, you know, 10-year-old kids that had run away that needed help. and. I mean, they were just absolutely inundated with phone calls. And that's, that was the first inkling I had that really had something going here and that it was making a difference and, and you know, hitting, hitting that audience the way it was. There was, a, there was also, um, there, there was an article in Time Magazine, I believe, about Jim also during that time period, which indicated what an effect it was having on people. But, but actually, it, it took quite a while for me to realize the true uh, reach that Jem had and, and, and the true effect that it had on people. I, I think probably decades later, um, I was in contact with fans through the Truly Outrageous newsletter and I started getting more and more of a sense of it. And then we get to GemCon and it's like, wow, this, this really is something. And then, and then it got to the point where I'd go to work like at Zynga when I worked at Zynga for six years and people would find out I did Jem and I'd discover how all these fans that I worked with <laughs> at Zingo or you know, other companies that that were impacted by Jim. And so it's, it's really quite amazing. I think that really just speaks to your writing skills and that it's um, such a such a niche um, show, but such a universal appeal is what we, we called it <laughs> earlier when we were having our cartoon <laughs> panel. Um, I would love it if you could just talk about, I know you mentioned GemCon and kind of more recently um, figuring out just how robust the fan base is. Did you, did you really um, interact with anyone from the show when you were working on it? It seemed like it was very siloed at the time, just because of um, technology and what have you. Well, because of, of the fact that everybody was so spread out and because 
um, both ha well, Hasbro was in Rhode Island and uh, Griffin Bacall and, and Sunbow were in New York and I'm out in California and a lot of the writers are out in California, but I mean, we're, we're all spread out all over the place. And I lived, I always, I always ended up living in kind of um, hidden, isolated little mountain towns <laughs> like I am right now. So um, yeah, we had to do a lot of stuff remotely, but one thing about, about Sunbow that is they, they treated writers so well. They were so good to their people. They would, I just, I can't say enough good about them, but they would, uh, you know, sometimes fly me out to New York. They would like, fly me to Rhode Island to meet with people at Hasbro. And not, not a lot of this, but, you know, enough to, to create that sense of camaraderie or they'd have a party out in, in Westwood in Los Angeles for everybody. And, you know, they would have gatherings and get us together. And, and uh, so there would be some social contact. And of course, some of the people that I worked with in uh, Los Angeles were friends of mine, so we would occasionally get together at other kinds of uh, other kinds of uh, meetings. Were there people who you met for the first time at JumpCon, um, as far as guests go, who were involved with the show or the toy line in any way? Uh, well, all the voice actors. I had never met any of the voice actors. Um, I knew the voice director Wally Burr because he worked on GI Joe as well, and he was in LA, and I and I knew Wally. Um, while he amusingly gave, tried to give me the best compliment he could give me for my writing on G.I. Joe. And he, he, and he didn't, you know, he got to remember he was a man of a certain generation, but, but the best compliment he could think of was, I really like your scripts, you write like a man. <laughs> so uh, while he was such a character, but I never met any of the voice actors. I never, I never, I had maybe, there was maybe one person at Hasbro I had contact with and she was a high level executive, but it was very, very minimal contact. So I really didn't know any of the people involved, the dolls or the toy line or fashions or any of that stuff at all. I mean, I, it was like you say, it was a pretty siloed kind of situation. So yeah, so it wasn't until GemCon that I met any of these other people. And I love Samantha. She's wonderful. I mean, all, everybody's wonderful. Ellen is wonderful. All, all the, you know, Brit is wonderful. All, all of the people that I met are just, fantastic people and great talents that and that was the i think that was probably the key thing about jim by whatever magic alchemy it was the perfect storm of all these wonderful creative elements you know we had these fantastic composers and people writing lyrics we had fantastic artists and, and designers and fashion designers and the people at Hasbro were great and the people at Sumbo were great and we had great writers and we, you know, we just had this wonderful collection of talent that all came together in the same place at the same time and just created something that's truly unique. That's so, um, I think a lot of people feel that, feel that way about it. It definitely, all the, the circumstances just kind of lined up nicely um, for it to work out the way it did. And the fact that we have so many people who love the cartoon and the toy line, and yet there were completely different teams working on both of those properties. It just really goes to show you um, how cohesive and strong um, the gem brand is, which leads me to, um, it wouldn't be a discussion with you if we didn't at least just touch on the gem movie that came out a couple years ago. Um, obviously, everyone has different opinions about it. Um, whether you liked it or you didn't like it, um, we're going to keep it cordial since it's um, GemCon and we want everyone to feel free to express their opinions. Um, but we just love to kind of quickly get some of your input into um, the Gem movie. Um, you're, you were, you had a cameo with it. Um, would love to kind of just hear about that and then kind of hear a little bit about what your thoughts are for where you think um, the gem brand can go, especially this year, it's the 35th anniversary of um, the brand and the show. Um, so we'd love to just have you um, touch a little bit on that, if you wouldn't mind. So at the time it, that all happened, I was working at uh, Zynga as a narrative designer and game designer. Narrative designer being someone who works story in, into the gameplay. And uh, I suddenly got a call from a PR department at Hasbro, who I think very belatedly realized that they should give me a heads up that the next day they were going to announce a gem movie. So that was the first I knew of it. I, I had coincidentally had started working months before with another independent producer, and we were going to, we were putting together a treatment and wanted to go and, and pitch the idea of a gem movie to Hasbro. So. We had been working on that, and then suddenly I get this call that there's already a movie that's going to be announced. 
so they let me know this and I, I wasn't happy. I mean, how, how happy could I be that I knew nothing about it and that I wasn't involved with it. And then the next day I got a call. Um, they said, well, John Chu would like to talk to you. And I said, okay, fine. You can call me. So the next day he called me and we, we had a, a talk and he, he asked for input and advice. And the primary piece of advice I gave him was that I felt that I should have treated Shana and Aja a bit more like sisters. I tended to, to treat them more like friends and I should have actually created, I think, a bit more of a cohesive sense of, of them being Jerrica's sisters and Kimber's sisters, you know, more than just close friends. So, you know, a little bit of emphasis on that would be good. And I said to him, and I would really strongly advise that you keep the, the Jem Jerrica Rio, you know, triad thing going. I think that's a strong thing and I, I would advise keeping that going. But at this point, he already had a script written. It was done. It was a done deal. They were about to start production, you know. But at any rate, I really liked John Chu. He was very passionate, very sincere. He had been fighting for, for years to get Hasbro's uh, approval to try to do an, a low budget movie. And, and so I ended up really liking him quite a lot. And he invited me to come down to LA. He flew me down, his expense paid for everything so that he could actually show me the presentation he'd made to, to Hasbro and talk through the movie a little bit more. And, and so I li ended up liking him a lot. And, and I didn't want to be the kind of person that was just going to try to destroy something just because I was annoyed that I wasn't involved with it, uh, even though I think that was a mistake. But, um, you know, I didn't want to be that kind of a person. I didn't want to just be a spoiler kind of a person. I wanted to, to, to give him a shot to try to do it and see what he could do with it. And so consequently, he asked me if I would do a cameo and, I, and because I liked him enough, I, and I, I thought, okay, it, it'll be fun. And so sure enough, they flew me down, treated me like a complete queen and, uh, you know, treated me with tremendous respect and, and everybody there on the set and the cinematographer and, and all of the people involved were, were just wonderful to me. Uh, I met the, most of the young actresses, uh, the, the young woman that actually, Audrey Peebles was so uh, heavily into that all the, the super complicated makeup and, and the scene she had to do that I didn't really get to talk to her, but the other actresses that played the holograms were just sweethearts and came up to me and, and we just had wonderful time talking and they were they were terrific and so I, I don't like I don't like giving crap to the people who did their best you know I just think it's unfortunate that the show was well intended but they didn't do jam I mean ultimately when you get down to it the big mistake they made is they didn't actually do jam they had a mistaken idea of what jam was and what jam was about and made major major mistakes in the story and the script and ended up doing a kind of female Justin Bieber story rather than doing Jam and the Holograms. And I think some of that probably came from Hasbro and, and, and uh, this, it was like they wanted to get a new young audience, which is fine, but they, they just abandoned their whole existing audience by doing that. You know, everyone who actually cared about Jam and who, who would have brought their kids to the movie, you know, they weren't getting jam. That's not what it was. You know, it, you had helpless young teenagers. You didn't have young women who were in charge of their lives. You know, had these, these girls who were helpless young teenagers and you had, I mean, let's not even get into what Synergy was. And the movie, Moosh Motion, uh, the music company, ends up going to Rio. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, so, I, you know, it just wasn't jam. That, that's about the best thing you can say about it. It's not that it was like the worst movie in the world. I mean, had it just been released as some other kind of movie, it might've done all right, but people going there because they wanted jam and they didn't get jam. Christy, I see so many, I don't know if you can see everyone, but I see so many people nodding their heads and there's such yeah. activity in the chat Raven room. especially is going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think you so eloquently stated what many fans <laughs> um, 
felt. Um, and before before we open it up into um, Q and A, it sounds like um, if there were an opportunity for you, if you, if someone, let's put it this way, if someone hypothetically approached you and wanted you to be involved in revamping the Gem brand, um, what would you say to that? If I could do it my way, I would do it. But it would have to, they'd have to let me do it my way. And I, you know, I've had ideas, I've had many ideas because I've, like I said, I've worked with two different producers over the decades trying to, to figure out what the approach should be. The, the biggest issue in trying to figure out what to do with Gem 35 years later, you know, is do you make it a period piece? Do you just go back and set it in the 80s? Or do you try to actually just reboot it? Uh, with the movie, obviously, that's what they tried to do was just, you know, completely reboot it. But I mean, you, you could do it either way. There, either way could be made to work. And the biggest question that could never really get resolved was, which was the better way to go about it. And I kind of, what I wanted to do was start in the 80s, get some resolution, and then keep moving forward. Not, not necessarily a period piece, but kind of a cross between a period piece and a reboot. You know, and I, and I would still like to be able to do that, but um, that would be the only, only way I would take something on is if I could do it the way I wanted to. Seeing lots of head nods in the, the little <laughs> Zoom boxes. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, um, so I want to open it up to some Q&A. Please feel free just to type your questions in the chat box and we'll... Um, um, get you get you in. Some of the questions that I did see pop up um, while we were chatting earlier, Christy, um, there was, we have our very first Black Lives Matter panel tomorrow, which is very exciting. Awesome. Um, would love to talk about, um, I know there was discussion about the character Jetta was originally supposed to be African American and that whole idea was next, but would love to just hear a bit more about that. And also um, there were some very non-traditional characters that you were able to create for us, like Tech Rat, for example. I don't think there was a Tech Rat before Tech Rat. Um, so we'd just love for you to kind of chat a little bit more about the character of Jetta um, and Tech Rat. And um, please just everyone keep typing in your questions in the, um, the chat box and we'll um, get, your, get your questions in as they come in. All right, so Jetta. So here's the situation is that we, we have 65 half hours of animation to do. And we start out with a certain set of characters, which are based on a set of dolls. And then as they would introduce new product, we would introduce those things to the show. Like KGEM was introduced because they created an actual playset, a little stage, you know, a radio kind of stage playset for it. So it, it was connected more to the toy development seasons than anything else. And so you got to a point where they, want, they decided they were going to introduce a new set of, of dolls, so they became a new set of characters. So they said, okay, we, we wanna add, we're gonna add a new hologram <clears throat> and we wanna add a new misfit. And the new hologram is going to be Hispanic, which I thought terrific, wonderful. She was originally called Timpa Timpani and then they changed it to Rhea. And they said, oh, and we're gonna be adding this, you know, a misfit. And I said, you know, terrific. I, I was saying this to who was I? I think I was talking in a meeting with Joe Bacall and I think it might have been Joe and Tom, but it might have been Joe and Jay. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, but we were actually in a meeting and I said, terrific, you know, the misfits are all white. So let's, let's mix it up a little bit and let's make this new character black. You know, so we've got a little diversity in there and they're like, oh, God, no, we can't do that. Uh, and, and I was like, well, why not? And they're like, oh, no, no, we can't do that. You know, can't have a bad character like that. We, you know, we, you, you, she could be Australian or she could be British if you want to do something different. I'm <laughs> like, okay. And I, I'm just laughing because to me, this is just like so silly. And, and they actually had the grace to blush and look a little embarrassed. But, but that was the, the mindset of the time, you see. Uh, you could have all they wanted diversity in your good role models, but you didn't want, you just, you know, if they were bad, not good role models, you know, <laughs> I had to be white. So, okay, fine. So that was when I said, um, all right, well, just to shape, change, you know, change it up a little bit, let's make her British. And then I made them promise me that they would hire an actress who was actually British and not just some American actress doing a bad Cockney accent. And they, they promised me that. So <clears throat> later I, I got a, an, 
audio audition tape. I wrote up dialogue for the actresses, you know, to try out. They call that sides. You give these sides to the voice actors to, and they use that to audition with. And so I heard the, there were like four voices on this tape and I'm hearing a bad American Cockney accent. And then I'm hearing a bad American Cockney accent. And then I'm hearing another bad American Cockney accent. And then finally, I hear this wonderful voice, wonderful British voice. I said, okay, her. So that's how Louise Dorsey got cast. So that was a part of the thinking of the time, you know, you, that that's why that happened. Now, Tech Rat, I was inspired by Boy George and I wanted Tech Rat to be an androgynous character, you know, based on a kind of a Boy George kind of a character. And, and, and so I wrote him that way. I wrote it, him as an androgynous, you're never quite sure, male or female, you know, kind of a character. And they could not cope with that. <laughs> it was just like, no, no, we can't do that. Male or female, you got to decide one or the other. They just really couldn't handle the notion of doing that kind of a character at that time. So I, I made, a, made Tech Rat male, and uh, that's how that went. <laughs> So in the two minutes or so that it took you to give us more insight about Jetta and Tech Rat, we have 32 questions that, 32 <laughs> questions that came in, and we've got about five minutes left um, for the I, I don't session. Care. I don't mind if we go longer, as long as we don't step on anybody's feet. Okay. Um, if we can have someone on um, PSA, someone on the, the GEMCON staff, maybe um, get in touch with the three ladies on our next session. I know it doesn't start till 3.15, but I think it sounds like everyone would appreciate it if we went over even just a few minutes for this, especially since we had some tech issues in the beginning. Um, I'm just, I, I was taking note of, um, there was um, some repeated questions that popped up, so bear with me. Um, just want to make sure that the more, um, the frequency of the, the questions gets addressed. So one question, um, a lot of people want to know more about Rio. Did you envision him to be a cheater? <laughs> I know you originally intended to kind of reveal that Jem and Jericho were the same person, but it never ended up happening that way. Um, yeah, we don't want to just hear a little bit more about what your vision was for Rio. Yeah, Rio, it, it's interesting. Um, as I started working on the on the show, I also got a bunch of line art. Um, they had they were drawing up model sheets for the characters at at um, Sumbo Productions, and so they they sent me a whole bunch of line art for these characters. And I looked at this line art for Rio, and I actually just fell in love <laughs> because he was the line art was so wonderful. I mean, if you could see the the original way he looked, not the way he ended up looking in animation, but you know, he was just gorgeous character. And I just thought, oh man, I'm just in love with this guy. So the whole idea was to explore the two sides of Jerrica. You know, there's, there's Jerrica who has to be the everyday responsible, ordinary person taking care of all of these foster girls and trying to keep a house together in one piece. And she's got, you know, someone who's been a boyfriend for a long time. They kind of take each other for granted. And then suddenly she becomes this mysterious, completely glamorous other entity called Jem. You know, she's just this, it's like she can completely cut loose and be this entirely different person. She can be, you know, musical and creative and, and just, isn't weighed down of all the burdens and responsibilities, but for her internally, she's still herself. And so it's easy to forget that when she's dealing with Rio, that isn't Jerrica dealing with Rio, it's Jem dealing with Rio. And trying, I even tried to show that in one, the one episode where she has trouble remembering who she is at any one given time. And for Rio, he's basically in love with the same person and he doesn't know it. So it's hell for him because, because he's always cared about Jerrica and he's known her for a long time. And all those same essences and traits are still there in Jem. And so he can't help being attracted to Jem. And so the, I, I really would have played out more that um, more fun about it driving him crazy. I mean, if, if we had maybe had a little more time to, to play with that. But I never saw him as like a cheater per se. I just saw it as, as people locked into this really bizarre situation, not knowing any better. And, you know, she keeps wanting to tell him, but then as more time goes on, she knows that he has a terrible temper about being tricked or deceived, you know, something she's experienced earlier in her life. And, and it just becomes harder. I mean, I, I imagine you've been, I'm sure you 
maybe many of you have been in a situation where you let something slide without telling somebody something you should have told them and then longer it goes on the harder it gets you know to try and own up to something until it becomes almost impossible and uh I, I just thought it was a lot of fun playing that the dynamics that were involved in that very cool. Well, what's nice about the GEM fandom is even though we had about 30 questions that popped up in the comments, um, we have a lot of people who are actually answering some of those questions. Um, people, <laughs> everyone's knowledge is different. So just goes, goes to so, show you how um, committed the GEM fan base is. Um, we got time for a couple more questions. So I'm going to try to combine two questions that are very similar um, that popped up a few times. One being any episodes or storylines that were particularly special for you and any characters that you wish you could have um, done more with or fleshed out a bit more. <sighs> there was there was some secondary characters that I, I thought we could have fun with that I never got around to doing anything with like Rhea's brothers and but they were all secondary. I mean, I, I thought all of the main characters were served pretty well and, and got to do a lot. Um, I don't think there was anybody that necessarily got shorted that, that you know, some people might have wished to see more, more background on some of the stingers or something like that. But, you know, we only had so many episodes left at that point because the stingers were like the last um, bit of toy development product development that happened and they never I don't they never even got released as far as I know so um somebody was saying the limp lizards okay <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure what the, why there's such an interest in the limp lizards I noticed over the years people are like what about the limp lizards and I'm like they were just like a throwaway <laughs> you know just for humor but uh, that, that's sure let's do a whole show about the limp lizards I think that'd be great <laughs> but um I just loved being able to do shows like um, like the Runaway Two-Parter, you know, the music awards stuff where we see at the end that unlike what Pizazz might think, winning isn't everything. You know, it's, it's, there are more important things in life, it, which is very much a theme of GEM. Uh, certainly one of the underlying themes of GEM is, is what's important in life are, are your relationships with the people around you. So we have a couple people here who said Broken Glass should have won a Grammy and it was the voice of our generation. So lots of Limp Lizards fans here. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, wrapping it up, I know we talked a little bit about the movie. Um, we had a few people ask if you were consulted or involved at all with the comic books that came out a few years ago. Uh, no, I wasn't consulted about them, no. Um, the, the writer and the artist both uh, separately contacted me via email, and we had very, very nice email exchanges, and they're both delightful, wonderful people, and um, put a lot of heart and soul into what they did, and I thought they did a really nice job. I thought they did a lot of good things with the comic, so I, I heartily approve of them, and they're good people. Very cool. And then... We had a couple of people ask if, when you wrote um, the last episode, if you knew it was the last episode. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that episode was definitely written as a farewell to the show. We, we were uncertain for a long time. In fact, we were down to, I think, just a, the last handful of episodes, I believe, when we finally got the word that um, Hasbro would not be proceeding any further, that there would, wasn't going to be any additional episodes. Because you could go beyond the 65. I mean, it could have actually have renewed for additional. But um, at that point, I guess the toy line was not doing well enough for them, and they knew it then, and, and so they decided not to go any further. And um, I wrote that as, a, as a, a love note and a farewell to the series. Very cool. Um, Christy, where can we find you um, on social media? Uh, I have a Facebook page called Christy Marks Clubhouse, which I, I certainly would welcome anybody to come and visit me there. I, I don't post a lot there, but I'll try to be better about posting, but I do post there every once in a while. Um, I do have a, a Twitter, if anybody wants to follow me on Twitter. I have an Instagram, although again, 
I haven't been posting there much lately, but I'm going to try to get better about that. Instagram, I mostly just post pictures of my cats or my plants or something. <laughs> but, you know, I do something every once in a while there. But I, I am pretty active on Twitter, although a lot of it's political, so be warned. I, I want you all to vote. Everybody, American citizens, vote. This is such an important election. We cannot have another four years of this. Our democracy will be destroyed. So just make sure you're registered. Make sure they don't purge you. You know, check your registration and get out there and vote, whatever it takes, by mail, whatever. Just do it. That sounds like our own personal PSA. So thank you, Christy. <laughs> we, we've had several people say that um, they could listen to you all day. Um, unfortunately, we only have an hour and our time is up. But I would um, encourage everyone on the call, if you have additional questions maybe that you we weren't able to get to because of time constraints, please feel free to post them in the virtual GemCon group or even go to the Christy Marks Clubhouse page. Um, she is very um, great about interacting with fans and um, very, um, very engaging. So Christy, thank you so much for taking the time um, to join us and for um, sticking with us and hanging in there with us. Um, would have been nice to see you in person, hopefully next year in Minneapolis, um, we can make it a reality. I, I see people crying, um, some people are crying. So I think it's safe to say it was a well-received session. So everyone give it up for Christy Marks. Thank you. And I, I, I miss being able to see you all. I miss being able to give hugs and get hugs. And let's just hope that uh, next year is going to be a lot better. <laughs> You're here. Thanks, Christy. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, everybody. Love you. Oh, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Christy.